Guten Morgen. Uh, that's about as much German as unfortunately that I know, so that my, my presentation today will be in English. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Hall. I'm uh, from the FreeDOS project, and so today I'm going to talk about uh, DOS and FreeDOS, which is an old operating system, but it's still kind of cool, even in 2017. Uh, so my presentation is actually under the Creative Commons. You can actually go to our website uh, and download a copy of the slides if you like. So let me, tell me, tell you, let me tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, when, I, when I was growing up, uh, the Apple II was a very new thing. And, um, and my parents brought home uh, a, a clone of an Apple II called the Franklin Ace 1000, uh, which you see up there. And uh, that's where my brother and I taught ourselves uh, to do computer programming. And so we, uh, we, we weren't taught. It was back then you had to learn from the book. And so we got the book out and we... Uh, taught ourselves how to write uh, programs in AppleSoft Basic. Uh, and if you haven't learned Basic, it's an interesting language. It's a very limited language, but it's actually a very interesting language. You can do a lot of stuff with it. And we used this for a number of years. Uh, and then uh, uh, IBM came out with the uh, IBM Personal Computer. Uh, and this is a picture of one of the first ones that we had. Uh, very modern with this separate keyboard and green and black display. Uh, and that ran uh, an operating system called MS-DOS. And who here remembers MS-DOS? About a little over half of us, which I have to admit I'm surprised by. Uh, if you don't know MS-DOS, uh, MS-DOS uh, uh, was uh, an, old, it's an old operating system. Uh, and DOS stands for Disk Operating System. And that's because uh, in, the, in the black here, with especially that where you see the red light, there are two floppy drives in there. Floppy drives are about, I don't know, I think the floppy drives are about five and a quarter inch, so about, about that big. Um, and they held a whopping 360K of data. Uh, you could put about an image on there if it was a low quality web image. Uh, and so disk operating system really was uh, intended to uh, boot from the, from the floppy disk uh, and get the computer up and running. It, and, and when you look at DOS, DOS really was meant to run applications, and it did that very well. Uh, unlike Unix, which is designed to run lots of different uh, utilities all at once, thinking back to the early days of Unix especially, uh, you can glue utilities together you can, on the command line, uh, and you can do lots of different manipulations uh, through the Unix command line. DOS wasn't like that. Uh, DOS was very simple. DOS was designed uh, to boot up to a command prompt and you'd run an application. And there were utilities uh, that you could run from DOS. Uh, but, uh, and, and some of them uh, we've actually built up in FreeDOS to be very mature. Uh, but uh, the original DOS was really meant to, to start up applications. And this is actually what DOS looked like. This is uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the disk partitioning program uh, under MS-DOS 6. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, I just grabbed this as a screenshot, but it's just a, uh, an example of everything was text-based. And I used DOS after I moved from the Apple and I moved to DOS, I started doing computer programming on DOS. And again, I taught myself how to do computer programming. I got the book out. And I taught myself how to do computer programming um, on DOS. But I also really got into the applications. And there were a lot of applications that you could run on DOS. One of them uh, was WordPerfect. And uh, WordPerfect was probably one of the more popular uh, programs on DOS back in the day. Uh, and I think this is WordPerfect 5.2, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, uh, WordPerfect, uh, as I say, was one of the ones that I used going into college, uh, which tells you about how old I am. Uh, and so I, I used WordPerfect going into, uh, into college. Actually, it wasn't even this version. This, is, this version came out while I was in college. But um, I used WordPerfect to write uh, my, my papers for class uh, and, to, and to just anything I needed to write. There were also spreadsheet programs, which I don't have a, a picture of. But spreadsheet programs like... Uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, uh, that, that was really the uh, killer application uh, for DOS back in the day. Um, 
and I really, as I say, I, I really got into DOS, and I really liked the fact that I could do uh, as much as I could under DOS. I, I didn't have Unix at this time. I, I wasn't a, a, a Unix user uh, until after I had been in uh, at, at university for a couple of years. And so everything in my world is really about DOS. Uh, and I, I used what I had learned about computer programming, and I, I extended, uh, I wrote my own utilities to extend the DOS command line. And so I made DOS even better by, uh, by adding different functionality. Because if you remember, those of you who, who used DOS back in the 90s, 80s, and 90s, uh, DOS had a very limited command line. I mean, you could do certain things with it, but it didn't let you do a ton. And so I wrote my own utilities that would uh, expand the functionality of DOS. And it turns out a lot of people did that. Uh, in, the 19, uh, in 1993, you started to see a lot of uh, news articles about uh, DOS was going to go away. Uh, Microsoft started doing all of these uh, interviews in news magazines, that's, you know, technology magazines that said, you know, we're getting ready for the next version of Windows. And the next version of Windows is going to completely get rid, get rid of DOS. DOS will be dead. And if you remember what Windows looked like back then, this is what Windows looked like at the time. This is Windows 3.1, uh, and it was not great. Uh, it, it, it at least uh, was more stable than, than uh, Windows uh, 2, which, which crashed all the time, but Windows 3.1 was not that great. And so I looked at, at Windows, and I said, man, if, if the next version of Windows, Microsoft Windows, is going to be anything like this, if this is what Windows 4 or Windows 3.2 is going to look like, I wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, although it turns out the next version of Windows was Windows 95, and that was better certainly than Windows 3.1, but uh, I wanted to have more control uh, over my computer than, uh, than Microsoft really was willing to give you. Microsoft was trying to drive that car, uh, and I wanted to have more control over my computer. Now, I'd used uh, Linux by this point. I, I had just installed Linux in 1993. Uh, there was a, an early uh, Linux distribution called uh, Soft Landing Systems, which was advertised as being the, the soft bailout uh, for DOS users, uh, which, which meant me as a DOS user, I really loved it. So it was, it was, really, it was really great. It was my first introduction to Linux. Uh, and what I liked about it was it gave me the power of the big Unix systems that we had uh, in our uh, campus computer lab but I could run it on my home computer. And I thought that was great. And it was even better that developers from around the world were getting together and creating a version of Unix uh, for free and giving it away for free and sharing the source code for free. And I looked at that and I thought that was a great model. Uh, so in 1994, I said, you know, if, DOS, if Microsoft is gonna get rid of DOS, and I still like DOS, because I did, I still like DOS. I thought Linux was great, but I had all my applications under DOS. All my games were under DOS. And if you remember 1994, 1993, Linux didn't have a lot of games or a lot of full applications. Uh, so I still used DOS quite a bit. So I said, okay, if, if Microsoft is gonna be getting rid of DOS, then somebody should create their own. And so uh, in, um, uh, in, in actually May of 90, 1994, uh, I, I asked around on various uh, news groups, and I asked if, if anybody had considered writing a free version of DOS. And they all told me, no, but that's a really good idea. And you should do that. And I have a hard time saying no. And so in June of 1994, I finally said, okay, um, I'm going to write my own version of DOS. Uh, and so this is the actual announcement that I, that I posted in, in uh, June of 1994 to say, let's create our own version of DOS. Uh, it, was, it was surprising that, you know, I, I, I didn't know how many people would get together for this. You know, it, Linux was still very small, so I didn't really have an idea for uh, I, uh, how an open source software community would come together and create an operating system. That's really what we're creating. We're creating an operating system. But at the same time, I had this, I had this uh, naive 
simple assumption that uh, DOS was a very simple operating system, so it shouldn't take that long to build. Uh, and it turns out it, it took a lot longer. And we'll see the dates here in a second. Uh, but the first version of, uh, of free DOS at the time was called public domain DOS, PDDOS. Uh, and I'll, I'll just tell you that, that that name came from uh, me not really understanding uh, in 1994 when I was still a student uh, what the difference was between public domain and free software. Uh, within a couple of weeks of this, so in early July, uh, we had already changed the name to FreeDOS because we recognized we really were a free operating system. We weren't public domain. We were free. We were using the GNU GPL, GNU uh, General Public License, uh, for a lot of our code. Because not long after I, I posted this to uh, Usenet, uh, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. I had, I had a, a, a many people uh, from around the world asking to participate. Uh, you know, I'd written my own utilities to extend MS-DOS, and it turns out a lot of other people had done the same thing. And so the first thing that we did was we, we pooled our source code together, and we said, okay, who's written a, a, an extended version of this command? Who's written an extended version of this command? Uh, and we were able to very quickly uh, build a, a number of utilities uh, because we'd already extended uh, DOS in various, in various ways. We also went out and looked uh, at uh, FTP sites. That was, there weren't websites at the time. There was no www.anything at this point. Uh, but we did look on various FTP sites to look for uh, uh, open source software code uh, where, where it had provided uh, extended functionality of MS-DOS. So for example, there was a print spooler that somebody had made, very much like LPR under Linux, but uh, for DOS. And it worked in the background. It was actually really neat. So in 1990, uh, when, when was this here? This is, uh, I guess this is the next year. This is, this is what our website looked like. And if you remember early, early websites, this is very typical of them. The black background with yellow text, very easy to read. Uh, and so that was our website. We, uh, this was put up by one of our uh, contributors, a guy named Hannibal, um, as our first uh, website. But as I say, it took a long time. Even though we'd, we'd very quickly come together uh, and, uh, and created, uh, you know, pooled our source code and, and started to create an early version of, of FreeDOS, it took us a while to actually get to 1.0. And if any of you have followed FreeDOS, you know kind of where I'm going. So uh, we announced FreeDOS in June of 1994. Uh, we had various alpha releases uh, where it was very primitive. And then we started having these beta releases. Um, and, uh, and you can see we, 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 we walked our way up, uh, you know, alpha 1 through alpha 6. Actually, let me go through the let me go through the description. Uh, alpha one through alpha six was just us collecting utilities together, and uh, alpha one, alpha two were very simple uh, distributions. It wasn't until we got to uh, really alpha five, alpha six that things really started to look like a DOS operating system. Uh, but the thing about about the alpha releases is uh, what was really holding us back was uh, there was no installer. If you wanted to install FreeDOS back in 1997, it existed. It actually did exist, but you had to uh, create a boot floppy that we gave you a special command to do. Uh, and then you had to unzip all these different utilities on your own uh, to your hard drive and then use that boot floppy to actually make that hard drive bootable. And that was... It, it, it was very manual steps, but you know, and, and that was great if you were a DOS user, you know, already, and you kind of were familiar with the concept of using F disk to create your partitions and format to make a put a file system on it. Uh, it wasn't that great if you were a sort of a new user. And so, in in uh, in 1998, uh, I I realized, man, I don't I don't I don't want our Alpha Seven to be that way. I, we really need to have an install program. Uh, and over the course of a couple of weekends, um, I created uh, our very first install program. 
And it was very simple. It was bottom of the screen scrolling uh, install program, but it actually, you know, walked you through installing FreeDOS. And so in uh, 1998, March of 1998, we released our first beta. And that's, if you want to know what's different between alpha and beta, all that's different is we added the install program. Uh, I don't know that, very, certainly some utilities changed, but that's, that was really the defining feature between alpha and beta is we now had an install program. And you've probably heard this statement before too. When I created that install program, I said, I, I'm just going to create one just really fast, just so we can have an install program. And we'll fix it later. We'll make a better one for beta two. <laughs> that did not happen. Uh, so I'll tell you about the install program, how, where that went in a little bit, but just to kind of walk you through, you can see we have these different uh, beta versions, beta one through beta eight. Um, I was the uh, person who created the, the, uh, the, these distributions up through beta uh, six, and then somebody else came up with them. We had these cute names that we thought were cute for a while, and we stopped doing it. Um, and then we thought, okay, well, we're almost there. We're re how long are we in beta? I mean, it's, it's 2002 at this point. Uh, FreeDOS was created in 1994. Uh, we don't want to hit 10 years and still not be at 1.0 yet. That would be really embarrassing. Uh, so we said, let's, let's, let's actually push ourselves to, make, um, to, to get to 1.0. And so our, our person who was putting together distribution said, OK, the next version is going to be a release candidate for beta 9, and then we're going to 1.0. We said, great, excellent. Let's do that. So we had release candidate one for beta nine, and we had release candidate two, release candidate three, four, five, before we finally got to release can or finally the, the beta nine were outside the release candidates. And so if you do the math, that, that we, we, we went for over a year in these release candidates before we eventually walked ourselves up to uh, beta nine. Uh, and then we thought, okay, great. Our next version is going to be 1.0, except we're we just didn't have, we want to be perfect. By the time we get to 1.0, it should be perfect, right? So uh, our, our next version wasn't 1.0. It was uh, beta 9 service release number one. <laughs> and then a service release number two. And then we finally did it. Then we finally went to 1.0. Yay, that was very exciting. We finally went to 1.0. It was probably, I think FreeDOS may hold the record for, in terms of an operating system, longest time from initiation in 1994 to a 1.0 release in 2006. That's, that's a long time. But by the time we got to 1.0, it was a very good operating system. And we, you know, been able to, you, you had been able to use FreeDOS to run lots of DOS applications since the alpha times. Uh, but somewhere in those beta releases, we finally had the ability to connect it to a network, uh, to use a CD-ROM drive. That was a big deal, right? CD-ROM drive instead of just floppies. Uh, so, you know, by the time we got to 1.0, we actually had worked out enough um, functionality, enough features uh, that, that made it compatible enough with MS-DOS, you could actually install Windows on it, for those who wanted to install Windows. But... Um, <laughs> Because remember, the whole point was to not do Windows. But, but some people did want to run Windows on FreeDOS. And so 1.0 actually did let you run, did have enough capability in it, you actually could run Windows. Huh? Uh, version uh, 3.0, uh, the 286 version, because the 386 version uh, had, a, it had something that just didn't quite work until a later version. So... <laughs> Uh, you, but you could install it, and it ran, and that was, that was the important part. Uh, I'll also point out, um, 1.0 uh, still had the same install program I'd written back in uh, 1998. <laughs> so it took us a while to get rid of it. it, was, uh, it we, by that time, we'd modified it a bit. You know, somebody had said, well, uh, we, we, sh we can make this better rather than replacing it. We'll just put a a new interface on it, but the back end looked exactly the same. It had all the little things that I inherited from writing this thing over the course of a couple of weekends. Um, and uh, so in 1.0, we were still using the same thing that I said, we're just going to use this for now and we'll get rid of it in the next version. Still there, 2006 from 19, you know, 1998 to 2006. That was quite a, still, uh, still using uh, that installer. Um, 
So this is our, uh, our website that we released uh, when, we, when our, we did our uh, FreeDOS 1.0 release. Uh, so coming from our website that looked like that to now having a website that looked like that uh, was a big deal. Uh, I'll mention the FreeDOS fish, by the way, because some people do ask about the fish. Uh, I can't remember when, but I'm going to say, well, it was, it was in the betas somewhere. I'm going to say probably, it's on our website somewhere with the actual history, but I'm going to say somewhere around 2000. Um, I really wanted to have a mascot. Uh, you know, everybody, it seemed like everybody had mascots. Every, every open source software project had a mascot. Uh, GNU had the GNU. Uh, Linux had the Penguin. Uh, BSD had their Demon. Uh, everywhere you looked, there were, everybody had a mascot. That seemed to be the thing to have. Uh, and I thought, well, what, what can Freedos have as, as a mascot? Uh, and if you go on our website, and actually our ebook uh, talks about it as well, but the, uh, uh, I, I'd argued for a lemur. Uh, I look back now and I'm like, I'm not quite sure why I wanted a lemur, but a lemur I thought was pretty cool at the time. And I thought a lemur would be great. It doesn't really represent FreeDOS, although if you really think about it, no real mascot really represents the, the operating system except GNU. But, um, you know, I, I wanted, I wanted a, a lemur, but I couldn't draw. That's my thing. I'm very bad at art. So I couldn't create a mascot. Uh, somewhere in along the lines, start, people started creating mascots for us and, and submitting them. And somebody submitted a fish, uh, which for whatever reason caught on. <laughs> uh, and then uh, uh, an artist contributed uh, this fish, uh, which everybody loved. And so now we went from what was going to be a lemur to now a fish. Uh, and I thought that was, that was actually great because if you want to have... Uh, Fridas and Linux sitting next to each other, a fish and a penguin <laughs> go together. So that was great. So we had a, we had a, we had a fish. Uh, in case you're curious, uh, you know you'll, you'll notice he has a big googly eye, and so we named him Blinky. You know, but um, that's his name. His name is Blinky. Uh, so that was our website. So and then. Um, uh, and when we, we released a FreeDOS 1.2, and then eventually, finally, uh, just last year, in December, in fact, uh, we released FreeDOS 1.2. Uh, and there are some significant things about 1.2, uh, along with a better-looking website. But uh, FreeDOS 1.2 was the first one that had a new install program. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, all the way up until 2016, we've been using this, this uh, install program that I wrote back in 1998. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a long time. So that was, that was a while to have that. Uh, and uh, something interesting actually about the install program uh, in 1.2, uh, you know, the install program I wrote back in 98 uh, was written in C, you know? Compiled program. Uh, this install program is written in MS DOS batch file. Uh, it's uh, a man named uh, Jerome Scheidel uh, created a uh, a series of batch utilities, really smart batch utilities. And if you look at the installer, it's actually one gigantic DOS batch file. I mean, it's it's really impressive the work that he did. Um, so the install program right there is. Uh, is, is itself really, really impressive. Uh, so this is actually what uh, FreeDOS 1.2 looks like when you boot it up. I should have included a, a, a screenshot of his installer because it really does look nice, but this is what FreeDOS 1.2 looks like. And it looks very much like MS-DOS looked like back in 1994, which is the whole point. Uh, FreeDOS should, lo should look like DOS. Uh, and it does. Um, you know, we have more functionality now in FreeDOS uh, than MS-DOS really ever had. Um, we, uh, we, we have DVD support. Um, uh, we have networking support. There's a networking stack, not built into the kernel, but uh, that, that is now used in a number of different applications that we just provide. Uh, we provide development tools inside the operating system. Uh, it's really a full-fledged uh, operating system. Uh, it's almost like a small uh, Unix. Uh, and in fact, there's, there's been a recent interest 
in FreeDOS developers to create uh, a bunch of uh, utilities that mimic Linux and run it on FreeDOS to, to do a... There used to be a concept back in the 90s called a GNU-ish, where people would port GNU programs to MS-DOS before we had FreeDOS. And now there's, there's a resurgence. There's a, a, a new interest in, in, uh, in recreating these Unix utilities to run on FreeDOS, which I find very interesting. I, I, on one hand, I, I, I think it's really cool, uh, and I'd like to see that. On the other hand, if I want to run Linux, I will run Linux. Um, but I think it's very cool. It's, it's, it's getting people interested in, in FreeDOS that a year ago they, they probably wouldn't have been interested in, in doing anything for FreeDOS. So you're probably asking yourselves, it's 2017, who is using FreeDOS today? And it turns out a lot of people, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do use FreeDOS. And I'm, I'm, I'm continually today impressed by uh, the, the, the number of people that we have uh, using and downloading uh, FreeDOS. Uh, the, there are three main ways that people run FreeDOS today. And we actually did a, a survey on our website a, number, a couple of years back uh, when we did the 1.0 release to understand who's using FreeDOS. Why are you using FreeDOS? And uh, we found there are three different ways that people use FreeDOS. And it's still, it's still true today. Uh, one of them is to run classic DOS games. And that's today probably 90% of why people run FreeDOS. And that's, that's totally okay. I, actually, I'll, I'll be honest, most of the time I boot up FreeDOS, I'm probably running a DOS game. Uh, because just because they're old doesn't mean the game's not fun. So a lot of people do like to play DOS games. Anybody recognize this game? Commander Keen. Commander Keen. <laughs> I really like Commander Keen. So that's Commander Keen. So that's, that's, that's one reason that people use DOS, the free DOS today, and that's, that's why most people run free DOS today. But a number of people also run free DOS to run legacy applications. Uh, so why would you run a legacy application? Well, here's a real world example. Um, I used to work uh, at a university. And uh, we had faculty that, had, that were doing research from long ago, and they still have their floppies uh, from when they did their, their research years ago. And I had a researcher come into my office one day and say, I've got these floppies from back when I did research on whatever it was back in 1994. Um, and they were three and a half floppies, so they were still, they were still fairly modern, and um, we still had some machines that could read them. But the problem was that no programs could read the data anymore. Uh, it, was, it was some DOS application that had written data in a proprietary way, and we just tried various uh, programs to read it under, under Windows, under Linux, and we couldn't read the data. Uh, but we found a copy of the DOS program out on the internet. And so we installed FreeDOS uh, on, a, on a machine that we had in the office, installed the application, loaded this person's data from the floppies, exported it to a plain text file, which the, that researcher was then able to use. So sometimes legacy applications pop up even in 2017. And that example is from 2015. Although there was a more recent example where somebody had said that they uh, had a... Uh, actually, uh, uh, I work, today I work at a county. Uh, and if you don't know what counties are, you know, you've got cities and you have uh, states and you have the, the United States. Um, between cities and the state, you have counties. And so I work at a county. Uh, and we just replaced... Uh, an old uh, uh, enterprise asset management system that included as one of the pieces uh, a fuel tracking system for you know the, the snow plows and all the other vehicles that we have at the county. It tracked it on a DOS machine. <laughs> so we actually, you know, you do find DOS still being used today uh, once, you know, here and there. But I've also had other people talk to me about uh, they have a, uh, a financial system that they'd used back in the, in the 90s that they now, for whatever reason, need to run a report against. You know, what were we spending um, our money on back in, the, back in the 90s? And we maybe didn't, con they didn't, maybe they didn't convert that data uh, into the modern system. So now they need to fire up the old system just to run uh, the legacy application. Uh, although this isn't uh, one of those programs. Anybody recognize this program? 
Uh, this uh, Lotus One Two Three. It's not actually Lotus One Two Three. It's a uh, it's a shareware program uh, because shareware was a really cool thing at the time back in the '90s, where uh, you could. Uh, people would create uh, programs, and they were closed source. They weren't open source, but they would give them. A, they they would sell them for very cheap, a few dollars. Um, and some of them, many of them, were quite good. And this is a program that was meant to uh, act just like Lotus uh, One Two Three. And in fact, it even used the Lotus One Two Three uh, WKS files, uh, and it was called As Easy As, because As Easy As One Two Three. So anyway, there's that. Uh, and, and so and some people use uh, FreeDOS to run legacy applications, and other people use it to run embedded systems. Uh, and this is still being used today. This is a, an application called Point of Sale POS uh, that does, uh, it's still being developed. Um, this version is from 2011. Not too many versions uh, now, but uh, this is a, a point of sale system that you can run, download and, and use in a store. And people do use this in stores. When I, when I worked at the university, uh, it was in a small town, and in that town were a number of um, you know, mom and pop stores, small, small uh, stores, and several of them were running this program on them to, to track their you know, everything, because they'd, they'd built the system back in the 80s and 90s, so why do it? Uh, and so that's why people run FreeDOS today in 2017, mostly for games, but also some legacy applications and also to do some embedded uh, systems work. Yeah? What about the real-time application, for instance, with respect to the predictability of the response times? Real? It's better than on the Windows 10, for instance. It, and, and that would be useful. I haven't, uh, uh, when we did our survey, that didn't come up. Mm -hmm. uh, people did not talk about real-time systems, uh, just because I think so many other people were doing these other uh, things with it. But yeah, real-time uh, system work, you can certainly do FreeDOS with that. Um, it, when we created FreeDOS, obviously the intention was to run it on a physical machine. And we still see a, a number of people running physical machines for FreeDOS. Uh, you know, it might be a Pentium computer. Uh, actually, you can boot it on you know, modern hardware. There's nothing wrong with that. I can run it on my, uh, na you know, natively, I can boot it on my 64-bit on my machine and it will run in 16-bit mode, um, and it won't be able to address the entire hard drive or all of the memory, but uh, it can do a lot. Um, and so, you know, some people do actually run it on physical machines. You start to see some people who have a, uh, an interest in restoring old computers, and so I'm getting emails today from people who are uh, restoring a 286 computer, a 386 computer, uh, so they can, it's just so they can run FreeDOS on it, which I think is really neat. Uh, but of course, today I actually recommend that people run it in a virtual machine, uh, and FreeDOS will run on any, really any virtual machine. And this is a, a screenshot from QEMU, uh, which is under Linux. And so uh, today, even though, as I say, we have a number of people who run FreeDOS on actual hardware, uh, I'd say most of the people who are running it in a virtual machine. I think that's probably safe. So. What's coming next? So we've been talking on our mailing list. Um, what is the next version of FreeDOS going to look like? Uh, and we had had these discussions a while back. Uh, when we were getting ready for, for 1.2, we actually had, had this discussion as well. And we were thinking, and actually I was even arguing at one point, although I've changed my mind, but uh, we, were, we were discussing, uh, you know, FreeDOS should it look like what a modern DOS should look like? And we'd had this discussion about a thought experiment. What would DOS look like today if Microsoft had not gone to Windows and they'd maintained DOS? It's an interesting thought experiment because computers would still comp continue to advance. You'd still have multitasking capable CPUs. You actually you had it at the time anyway. Uh, You'd have more memory, you'd have larger disks, you'd have networks. But if you'd actually had maintained a DOS operating system, uh, you'd still be running in text mode. That's the heart of DOS. Um, and uh, you'd, you'd have multitasking in it. You'd have large memory. You'd have large disks. You'd probably even have the capability to do disk arrays, removable media. Um, and 
at some point, you'd have to break application compatibility because someone's going to want to create a DOS application that can take advantage of multitasking and all these other things. So you're going to have to create a new uh, application format uh, to take advantage of these new features. And if you wanted to run the classic you know, legacy DOS applications, you'd have some sort of a virtual environment that, that would be there. And then we stopped and said, okay, that exists today. I could run Linux in, in run level three, text mode, and that gets me multitasking, large memory, networking. It's a completely different binary format. And if I wanted to run classic applications, I would run it in a virtual environment, which would be FreeDOS. So, okay, maybe we don't want to take it that far. <laughs> Uh, so we have been. We went back and, and thought, what really defines DOS? And so, if any of you are interested, if my presentation is interested in you, any of you in in free DOS, and you'd like to contribute, what we're talking about now for what that next version is going to look like, we, we really started to say it has to be a DOS. It still has to be DOS, and that means it has to be. You know, the next version of free DOS will still be 16-bit. It'll still run one command at a time, single tasking. It'll still run single user, right? As soon as you boot up the computer, you can do anything to it. In fact, that there was an April Fool's joke we had a couple years ago that said that there was a uh, security of vulnerability in FreeDOS. It had local user becomes root. <laughs> Steps to reproduce were basically boot the machine. Um, it, FreeDOS will still have a command line, and it will still run on old hardware. Because if, if FreeDOS doesn't run DOS applications, it's no longer DOS. And so that's really what it came down to. Compatibility is key. So when we talk about then, what does a modern DOS look like? What does this next version look like? When we talk about what, uh, our, our FreeDOS 2.0, which we think is going to be the next version of FreeDOS, will be a 2.0. What would that look like? Really, we've been looking at the tools. So this is sort of your preview into the, the future for FreeDOS. It, the, the next version of FreeDOS really will have a focus on tools. What tools do we have? What utilities do we have? And we're going to, uh, there are a lot of utilities that we're going to be asking ourselves. Uh, you know, we, we've previously uh, in, included these different um, uh, package sets uh, that we used to call disk sets from way back when. Networking, development tools, sound, uh, you know, games, uh, other. Third, other, other types of utilities. And of course, the goal has always been to make sure those are open source software. But the question that we're asking ourselves now is, what utilities have become, in FreeDOS, have become so core to FreeDOS that they should be promoted to what's called base? That we have this concept in FreeDOS called base that says if it's in base, it replicates functionality from old, the old MS-DOS. If you install just base, you basically have an MS-DOS system, and it would take up very, very little room. I mean, we're talking less than 10 megs of space. The full install takes more than that. But now we're asking ourselves, what utilities are we included in development or networking or sound or utils that really should be part of the core MS-DOS or core FreeDOS experience? And we're also asking ourselves, what utilities are we hanging on to that you know, we'll probably still keep around but are really there for pure legacy compatibility reasons. And so I got a couple of them listed up here. Uh, one of them is called append. Um, and append and assign uh, are very similar to each other. They, they basically allow you to um, uh, reference, uh, and join and subs are very similar to this as well. They basically, those are different types of tools that will let you um, uh, Put a directory, make a directory look like a look like a uh, a drive, and that was important because MS DOS MS DOS one uh, didn't support directories; it only supported drives. And so, if you had an MS DOS one program, it needed to be able to see things at the drive level, not the not the directory level. Well, that's that's really old. Um, we have the ability to do that. How often do people really need that? Uh, we'll still keep it around, but that, those are those are tools that we that we that we would take out. And then the, another one that's an easy one to take out uh, is called graphics. And if you don't know what graphics is, 
Uh, graphics allows you to take, a, uh, to take whatever's on your graphics display and use your print screen key. That was why it was put on there. And it would uh, it, you know, normally print screen in text mode would just dump whatever's on your screen right to your printer, your dot matrix printer, because that's what you had back in the 80s. But if you're in graphics mode, uh, if you had the graphics program running uh, behind the scenes, print screen would dump the graphics display to your dot matrix printer. Well, if we're running things in a virtual machine, there are many other ways to get a screenshot of your uh, Freedos uh, screen. So graphics is one of those utilities that we're going to be taking out. So we're still defining what does Freedos 2.0 look like. Uh, but it's very interesting to see that in 2017, we're still talking about what the next version of DOS will look like. Um, and I find this to be very uh, interesting and very engaging. Uh, you know, years ago, I never really thought that FreeDOS would make it past 2000. Uh, then I th thought it would never make it past 2010. Um, and now in 2017, we're talking about what 2.0 would look like. Uh, so if that, if that interests you, if you, if you think that you'd like to... to uh, play with FreeDOS or maybe even be part of FreeDOS. Uh, we've got links up here. Um, FreeDOS.org is our website. Again, you can download a copy of my slides from there. Um, we have our blog. And also, um, we're the only DOS project that has an active Twitter account. So there's our Twitter. Um, and that's, uh, that's my presentation about DOS then and now.